again welcome back to the latest lecture session. So, I believe in the last uh, set of uh, sessions we have been looking at a couple of examples that would uh, provide the context let us say with respect to uh, the applications of this course and I believe then we uh, moved on to looking at the course outline and started looking at or looked at in brief the relevant rules right the hazardous and other waste uh, movement and uh, transboundary movement and such the 2016 rules right we looked at that briefly and we did uh, we do plan to come back to that later and then we started discussing the relevant aspects with respect to risk assessment right. So, again uh, why do we need to look at or you know consider risk assessment now right. So, again this will help and let us say uh, the relevant uh, decision maker or policy maker or the relevant management to be able to identify those pathways which are relatively more what do we say potentially uh, what do we say troublesome let us say right and also right say to cut out let us say any subjectiveness right as in we did talk about this if you have a quantitative or your figure let us say that helps you know uh, what do we say in many or myriads of ways why is that let us say typically out there you know we have a lot of rumor mongering and such right uh, but if I can put a number in that regard let us say it will convey the information you know in a relatively better manner right. Again in that context we looked at a few uh, examples that would uh, I believe help us compare the different risks I think we looked at a few uh, light hearted uh, examples in that uh, context right. And in that regard uh, when we talk about allocating resources you know at least in the long term let us say uh, for particular purposes or such let us say right or for particular aspects how, uh, how are the decisions typically made right. For example, let us say India today is not the India it was let us say 20 years ago or 40 years ago the priorities then were different the priorities now were different same case with different countries or you know uh, human uh, uh, humans I guess right or different uh, sets of populations and such or different nations now right. So, again what I am trying to say is let us say my priorities earlier are different from my priorities now again you know the standards of uh, life or quality have improved and so on right. So, in that context let us say obviously the decision makers let us say can put a value on uh, what do we say uh, uh, human life I, I believe it is not greatly well practiced in the Indian context but to my knowledge it is practiced out there though obviously there are going to be political pressures depending upon uh, situation or scenario. But in general when we are looking at long term planning with respect to uh, taking up different measures or such we come up with these aspects you know how much is a human life worth I guess right. So, in this context uh, we are going to look at a particular uh, set of examples that would uh, illustrate this particular aspect better and again why are we looking at that because later on let us say when you are trying to allocate resources we are obviously going to look at which particular pathway uh, to uh, you know uh, pay greater attention to I guess right. Again coming back to uh, our particular aspect how much is saved life worth. So, I believe I have uh, a few examples here. So, again uh, any uh, changes or such or any improvement in infrastructure or changes in policy right you know they are going to have knock on effects and obviously uh, costs involved right. So, again that is why we have the uh, you know saying here safety regulations are rarely free of cost. So, here we have an example. I guess if seat belts cost let us say I think uh, 50 dollars per car I mean this is the data that I had from uh, New York times right and thus uh, the uh, data in uh, dollars I guess per car and equipping a million cars right with seat belts will save 1000 lives right. What would the regulators be assuming that the lives are worth right again you know simple math and such right. So, at least uh, 50,000 uh, dollar you know is the worth that we are what do we say. Uh, putting on uh, human life right. So, ex for example, if I am able to save 1000 lives uh, if, if I equip million cars or 10 per 6 cars with seat belts and it is cost 50 uh, per car 50 pounds or dollars per car pardon me right to be able to save this. So, you know how much uh, am I putting what is the worth I am putting on uh, human head I guess right it is 50,000 dollars. But obviously looking at that in uh, context I guess uh, looks like currently uh, at least in the western uh, world the worth of uh, human life is around 3 to 5 million dollars now right 3 to 5 million dollars. Again I did try to look up the uh, try to anyway uh, look up the relevant data in Indian context I have not found that out. For example, let us say when you hear of some accidents or such uh, you hear people doling out compensation, but usually they are politically influenced or emotionally influenced decisions I guess. But when we look at long term planning or such and so on right and look at relevant policy measures usually it is always a better idea to obviously have uh, what do we say some uh, worth associated with the human life right. 
And again, in that context, I tried to look at the estimate for Indian life, but I could not. But the nearest I came to was that it was around 20,000 rupees, right? That's what I came to see across. Again, you know, I guess the illustration, I guess, uh, light-hearted illustration anyway, 3 to 5 million dollars, uh, right, for uh, uh, the Western world or in the Western world typically. Again, these are generic uh, figures that I'm throwing out, but they are based on some research that I looked at. And again, in the Indian context, it seems it's around uh, 20,000 uh, rupees or so. Again, uh, moving on to our relevant aspect. So, how are decisions made? Let's say, for, if I look at different aspects or activities, let's say, and calculate the cost per life saved in dollar amount, I guess. I have various aspects here, various activities and various, uh, what do we say, costs associated uh, per life, I guess, right. So, looking at this, I believe again this data is from around 1980s or 1990s, I guess, right. Again, so if you look at these aspects, which particular aspect do you think the decision maker would, uh, you know, uh, try to look at first? Obviously, radiation safety standards for X-ray equipment, relatively lower cost. And we saw that the average was around 3 to 5 uh, million dollars, right, million dollars. So, obviously, you know, uh, the relevant person will see that the cost per uh, life saved here is less than the average that they usually consider. So, they can or would like to implement this particular aspect. Certainly, again, child restraints in cars because, again, as you see, that particular value is uh, lower than the average value for uh, life, right, per life and so on and so forth. Again, asbestos was banned in brake linings, this I am sure about, right. Uh, I think, uh, you know, you had issues with uh, relevant air pollution even in, uh, what do we say, the workplace where the relevant brake linings were, uh, what do we say, uh, fabricated and what do we say, put in place. So, this was, as I mentioned, you know, uh, put in place as in asbestos was banned in brake linings though. But this particular aspect as in asbestos being banned in automatic transmission, as you see it is 1.2 billion, billion as in 10 power 9, 1.2 into 10 power 9, but the average is a 3 into 10 power 6, right, 1.2 into 10 power 9. So, this being much higher than the cost of this particular average value that we place for a human, uh, on a human life, I guess. This particular, uh, what do we say, aspect as an asbestos in automatic transmissions has not had been banned uh, to my uh, knowledge, I guess, you know, uh, to my current knowledge anyway. But as you see, it uh, costs lesser to implement, what do we say, asbestos being banned in brake linings, let us say. And obviously, I guess, you know, you see the reasoning here. So, similar analogy here is, let us say, I guess, if you have limited resources and let us say you look at different pathways, let us say, uh, what do we say, uh, exposure pathway from the air, let us say, from ground water ingestion or uh, what do we say, dermal contact and so on. Then I am going to look at the uh, relevant resources, look at what do we say, uh, the relatively more, uh, what do we say, uh, riskier uh, pathway or pathway that would lead to greater adverse effects and then I would try to obviously remediate those particular aspects, I guess, right. So, again, uh, moving on, I guess. So, here we are going to move on to risk assessment, right. So, it is worth uh, looking at, I guess, a particular, uh, what do we say, set of terms that we associate with risk assessment. Let us look at what they are. So, it is systematic, right, and that is one particular aspect. So, systematic characterization of the adverse health effects from human exposure to hazardous agents, right. So, I am trying to characterize, characterize, right, the adverse health effects from, let us say, sustained or systematic exposure to hazardous substances. So, how do I characterize that? Obviously, you know, I'm, uh, the process obviously I am looking at is risk assessment, right. So, let us move on. So, there are four obviously major aspects in the context of risk assessment, right. One is the hazard identification, right. Again, that is uh, self explanatory. So, what are the chemicals of concern, right. So, let us say I am looking at a particular landfill site, let us say, right, or uh, we have a uh, industrial, uh, what we say, zone or set of uh, industrial clusters out there in near uh, Haridwar, right, or Badrabad, I guess, where, you know, there are issues with some contamination of groundwater and such and the relevant local population is concerned with it. So, let us say, if I am conducting the risk assessment there, obviously, you know, after the relevant analysis by, uh, if it is a heavy metals, AES or let us say GCMS or LCMS and so on, I can get the list of uh, chemicals of concern now. Right, just because they are chemicals of concern does not mean they are toxic. So, I need to obviously get, uh, you know, the information about, you know, what uh, adverse effects, if any, do you think these uh, uh, chemicals of concern are going to have. Also, I need to know 
what are the possible uh, pathways, right? What are the concentrations at the source, concentrations at the receptor and so on. So that would come in the context of uh, data collection and hazard identification, right? And then exposure assessment itself relatively self explanatory, we are going to look at that in greater detail again. And then dose response or toxicity assessments, again that is one particular aspect. So considering these three aspects obviously I can come up with characterizing the risk, right? I can now come up with a way to, uh, not a way I guess after the relevant calculations, I am going to characterize the risk and put a number on uh, the different kinds of risk from different pathways and so on. So in that context, you know obviously the risk has to be communicated either to the public or to the management and then it is up to the management to look at how they are going to manage this risk or how they are going to, you know, decrease this risk if required, right? Or let us say if uh, the risk is deemed to be too less, right? Uh, as in, I think for carcinogens, we do know it is either 10 power minus 4 or 10 power minus 6. Typically, 10 power minus 6 is what is looked at. So, if the risk is uh, posed due to the carcinogens in that particular area is less than 10 power minus 6, right? So, you know, the manager can say, or the relevant person or the decision maker uh, would probably take a call and say it is not worth uh, putting in more money or resources in this particular uh, remediation of this particular site, right? So, in that context, obviously, again, uh, if the risk is higher, obviously, the manager would need to look at which pathways to uh, consider, right? And to what extent does the risk need to be uh, decreased to? Again, we are going to look at these aspects in greater detail, but again, as I mentioned, hazard identification or data collection, exposure assessment, dose response. From all these aspects, we are going to look at the relevant calculations. We are going to look at a few examples uh, in due course, and then we are going to look at risk characterization and so on and so forth, right? So, moving on, obviously, as we talked about data collection or hazard identification. So, what are the chemicals of concern? For example, what are the chemicals of concern and does it have an adverse effect, right? So, again, uh, generic aspects. So, for example, how can I identify chemicals of concern? So, here I have an illustrative example because I wanted to, uh, you know, uh, uh, explain a couple of other points too. As in here, we have different compounds listed here, right? From sucrose to ethanol, aspirin, right? Uh, some of the commonly used compounds, let us say, to let us say uh, we have different uh, toxins here or pesticides here and so on here. Obviously, caffeine, right? So, you have that out there in coffee and so on. And here we have uh, what do we say, a metric called LD50. Uh, which is milligrams of that particular compound per kg of body weight. So, LD50 is the lethal dose uh, at which or the dose of the particular compound at which 50 percentage of the relevant uh, target population would uh, die I guess. But obviously, that is not a uh, worthwhile way to uh, look at our toxicity assessments, but I am having this table here to compare some aspects. So, typically as I mentioned for non-carcinogens or toxic compounds, it is a reference dose. And for carcinogens, it is the slope factor. These are the two variables that are typically considered uh, when we look at uh, risk assessment in the context of toxic and uh, carcinogenic compounds. So, we are going to go through them uh, later again. So, again, why am I bringing this up here as in, you know, every particular, you know, supposedly harmless uh, compound 2 can be a toxin, but obviously, the key lies in uh, the dosage, right? So, obviously, at remarkably high doses, even sucrose and aspirin and so on are uh, toxic too, right? So, the poison lies in the dose, you know, that is something that I am trying to uh, convey here, I guess. And obviously, as I come down to various pesticides or let us say cyanides or, you know, different poisons or such, nicotine again, something that is present in cigarettes, you see that the concentrations are remarkably uh, less. I mean, the lethal dose, 50 doses are remarkably less, right? So, obviously, here as we can see, you know, it is the uh, the poison lies in the dose, right? Again, something that I wanted to, uh, you know, point out, but typically we look at reference dose or slope factors and I believe you have uh, the agency for toxicity registry database or, you know, you can play around with those particular uh, uh, terms, I guess. Uh, you can Google them and you will have the relevant uh, standard values, but again, we are going to go into that in greater detail later on, right? So, again, data collection, what do I primarily look at? I need to identify the chemicals of concern. And as I mentioned, we need to look at concentrations and at which locations are they present and then factors affecting the fate and transport are some of the pathways there, I guess. So, again, I need to identify the uh, chemicals that are, you know, of issue in my opinion at this initial stage and then what are the different locations they are present at and at what concentrations, right? And then look at, you know, what are the factors affecting their fate or the transport primarily, I guess, right? At least at this particular context not context stage, we need to look at the data collection and hazard identification.
So, we will move on to the next particular aspect as in we did talk about dose response and toxicity assessment. I guess you know dose response that is uh, relatively uh, self explanatory. So, here uh, we need to look at let us say what level of doses or sustained level of uh, dosage at what sustained level of dosage will there be an adverse response in the relevant uh, what do we say uh, uh, human health or such let us say right. So, obviously again an example here is how is the identified adverse effect influenced by the level of exposure or dose right. For example, as I mentioned earlier. So, here we have dose different doses of the relevant compound and different adverse responses right, right different adverse responses here right. I mean we are going to look at this in greater detail. So, obviously though you are not going to conduct this particular toxicity assessment every time or the dose response uh, or try to get the dose response uh, behaviors every time you come up with a chemical of concern right. So, we do have the relevant or for more almost all the known compounds that are typically out there uh, you know the regulations approve the uh, what do we say relevant usage either for commercial or private or other uses uh, only after you know the relevant uh, what do we say toxicity assessments are done. And typically uh, I guess they are done how though you are going to obviously the uh, ideal case would be to get them done or the dose responses uh, behaviors uh, studied on humans now right. But obviously, there are issues uh, concerned there. So, you are going to look at the next best thing. You are going to look at rats or mice whose physiological behavior is similar to the humans I guess right. Again we are going to look at this in greater detail. So, again what uh, we need to look at is uh, the dose response curves or the toxicity assessment data needs to be gathered right. And in that context again as I mentioned the agency for toxicity uh, registry database or such you know that will in general have the. Uh, uh, relevant set of uh, data that you are looking for with respect to dose responses. But in this context we need to understand let us say why or uh, not why I guess the uncertainty is involved in this particular aspect, aspect as in how do we uh, you know come up with the dose response uh, what do we say behaviors and how do we come up from what do we say not come up from extrapolate let us say the data that we have on the animals to the humans. And obviously here uh, we have a lot of uncertainties involved and it is worth going into it in a relatively greater detail because you know whenever you consider risk assessment we need to keep in mind that there is still considerable there are still considerable uncertainties involved right. So, let us uh, move on and look at what we have here. So, sources of toxicity data right obviously preferably human studies in general let us say if there are case reports yes out there yes that is something we can look at and typically epidemiological studies that are let us say looked at let us say, say statistically based let us say analysis let us say of uh, you know groups of uh, what do we say population let us say right or relatively larger populations if I can use layman's terms I guess. But here it depends upon the efficiency of the epidemiological studies depends upon the level of controls that you have in your particular uh, uh, group I guess or studies. But typically though uh, difficult to get the studies done on humans. So, in general uh, we conduct the toxicity studies on animals I guess right. So, either we have specialized studies generalized or in vitro as in test tube uh, studies too. But in general we look at specialized toxicity studies if and when not if and when uh, in general when possible I guess. But obviously if, if especially if it is a pharmaceutical drug or such uh, human trials to my knowledge are necessary and in general uh, you might have heard of reports in uh, what do we say. Uh, India or such right uh, or from Bihar and such where obviously the poverty levels are uh, relatively high as you are aware of you know they served as labs let us say for uh, relatively uh, less stringent or relatively less regulated human trials right as in the big pharma companies from outside the country you know conducted human studies on our uh, you know poor brothers out there I guess. Anyway you know that is how uh, life is I guess right. Again human studies when possible uh, if not in general certainly animal studies. So, specialized toxicity uh, studies for pharma and such those compounds in general though human studies are uh, necessary right. And in this context why animal studies I guess as we just did uh, discuss this there is a good correlation with human disease as in let us say uh, the relevant responses right say that you would see in the rats or mice let us say the specific kinds of rats or mice in most of the kinds of diseases there is a good correlation with the diseases that you would observe uh, if the humans take that particular or ingest that particular compound I guess right. And also human carcinogens seem to be causing cancer in animals too right. Uh, 
So, again acute toxicity doses are similar in humans and a variety of animals usually rats and mice. I mean there are two kinds of exposures right or doses uh, right acute and uh, what do we say chronic I guess short term and long term. So, looks like there are similarities. So, obviously here what is the crux of the issue you are trying to estimate the effects on uh, adverse effects on humans. So, for that obviously you need to choose a test specimen, uh, specimen that would help you to come up with a worthwhile or you know accurate relatively accurate estimate. Obviously, there are uncertainties involved, but you need to look at the next best, uh, best thing I guess right. So, in that context we have been uh, going forth with that right. So, the next aspect would be anatomical, physiological and biochemical patterns are similar among mammals right. So, that is a major aspect right. So, the primarily the physiological and biochemical patterns are similar right. Again that corresponds to more or less the bigger picture here as in, in general animal studies uh, or you know toxicity studies on the animals uh, they we have we can have relatively greater uh, confidence uh, that you know uh, these results can be extrapolated to look at the or estimate the effects on uh, human health right. So, moving on I guess again there has been uh, what we see considerable body of uh, scientific evidence. So, thus it is uh, or these studies are accepted by the scientific community right again. So, what are some of the design issues for animal testing obviously right. So, you want to obviously mimic what you would expect out there in nature right. So, let us look at that. So, obviously route of administration is an issue as in you want to look at what routes of administration that the humans would be facing and then look at or you know try to keep it uh, keep the route of administration the same in the animals as in if you are looking at let us say uh, what do we say contact through the skin right. So, the same case needs to be replicated on the animals. So, the test species I guess right the kinds of test species we are going to look at that obviously there are controls as in you know you need to have what do we say the baseline information for uh, the relevant uh, what do we say test species that is something that needs to be looked at. So, for statistical relevance you need to look at the number of test species or subject right that needs to be looked at obviously dose selection. So, this is one aspect right I mean dose selection as in how do you come up with that doses though, though there will be some preliminary trials the crux of the issue is these toxicity studies are remarkably costly now right. So, how do I go about you know uh, uh, what do we say trying to relatively accurately predict the adverse effects on human health while also trying to limit the uh, what do we say costs and resources involved right. So, again this is something we are going to look at in greater detail later on and then duration of study as in let us say if I am looking at uh, carcinogens let us say right. We consider uh, with respect to carcinogens we look at lifetime cancer risk as in uh, we assume that the cancer risk is uh, you know can be or is due over the course of the lifetime now. So, for that ideally what do we need to do we need to observe the relevant effects uh, for the relevant effects over uh, one the subjects lifetime or such. But obviously again due to costs and relevant time and resources that is not feasible. So, what do people do they typically look at accelerated trials at higher doses. So, that is again something we are going to discuss I guess right and then relevant observations right. So, here we are going to look at the uh, general guidelines from the national toxicology program right you obviously have guidelines obviously depending upon the case they are going to differ, but I mean we are just going to briefly summarize let us say what it is these guidelines are the generic guidelines anyway. So, two species I guess based on their physiochemical uh, physiological and biochemical uh, what do we say behaviors and their responses uh, seem to be relatively similar to what we would expect in uh, humans. And for uh, rabbits too are considered specially when you are looking at effects on the neurological system, but for most of the other aspects I believe rats and mice and these two kinds of rats and mice are looked at. So, number and gender of animals per group obviously you need to look at let us say uh, keeping the control such that uh, you know you try to mimic what is out there in the nature. So, obviously we are going to look at 50 percent males and 50 percent females and 2 percent or higher incidence in that particular group as in if you take a test subject out there or you know test group of uh, humans out there right you would always have some uh, base level of or you know occurrence of uh, uh, cancer right. So, here we are uh, if I do not take that into account when I am conducting my study I am going to end up overestimating the adverse effects of this particular chemical or compound uh, when it is uh, you know uh, when the mice are uh, these rats are exposed to this particular compound right. So, obviously I need to look at what is the base level of uh, what we say uh, cancer uh, 
uh, prevalence out there. So, or cancer in that context or that particular adverse effect out there and I need to see to it that those controls are relatively uh, what do we say stringent I guess right. So, again uh, doses you know different kinds of doses, but again depends upon you know uh, the resources available. So, you have maximum tolerated dose 0 for the control right. You also have to have the control as in with no dose what would be the effects and such right. So, different controls here again. But more importantly though the regimen for dosing again, so as we see they are typically typically run from 6 weeks to 24 months of age of the relevant uh, what do we say species I guess right. So, again as we see uh, if we are uh, trying to use such data for estimating lifetime cancer risks, there are uh, what we say considerable uncertainties involved here. And again uh, 38 samples or animals examined for endpoints that is a uh, different aspect which we are going to look at. So, what are the different aspect endpoints let us say where uh, you know you have uh, what do we say multiplication of your or greater uh, probability of the adverse effects I guess right. So, what are the typical endpoints now right uh, it could be lungs uh, the nervous system right and different aspects we are going to look at that certainly the respiratory system blood and the lymph nodes obviously right lymph nodes typically prone to cancer, the liver right, kidney obviously, the nervous system, skin and the reproductive to toxicity and finally, effects on embryo development right. So, these are the typical endpoints that you know can be affected or are usually affected by various uh, toxic substances or your uh, carcinogens right. Obviously, respiratory system, uh, blood and lymph nodes, liver and kidney obviously right, uh, they are what we say the cleaners of our particular body and such right. Again, I am going to skip this through. So, target organs most susceptible to chemical exposure obviously depends upon the root. So, percutaneous the skin, the lungs and the mouth right. These are the obviously the uh, primary routes through which what we see the chemicals are ingested. So, these are the organs most susceptible obviously to chemical exposure right. So, moving on we are now going to come on come into the relevant aspects or discuss the relevant aspects with respect to dose response. Again, why are we looking at this? though you will not be calculating this right whenever you come up with a number for risk assessment right people think that you know that is the one and only number possible for risk assessment we are going to look at that those aspects too. But obviously, when we are calculating risk here let us say right there are uh, different variables that we use and there are uncertainties involved whenever we use these variables. So, for understanding the level of uncertainty behind these variables right we need to look at uh, the relevant aspects right. So, in that context obviously, I need to look at dose response curves. So, here I have a very generic example. So, here I have with increasing dose the adverse response here right on the test subjects. So, obviously, here you know uh, for carcinogens we usually come up with a linearized model for what we say non carcinogens or toxic compounds we come up with a different kind of model and uh, we are going to discuss this in greater detail right. So, I guess I am again out of time. So, we are going to look at the how do I come about let us say uh, uh, the looking at or understanding the dose response behavior for carcinogens and non carcinogens and then we will move on to looking at uh, what we say uh, risk assessment and exposure assessment right and then come up with a few examples and calculate the relevant aspects I guess right. So, with that uh, you know I will be ending it for this session and thank you.